Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland, and in this episode, we're going to be reviewing the Sim Labs P1 Black Edition Sim Racing Cockpit. Now, this is going to be part one of a two part review process. The first part is going to be the actual building of the frame. The second part, which will follow this, is going to be me actually mounting my steering wheels, pedals, shifters, seat, mouse, keyboard, and all the other things that'll get this cockpit into a running condition. So let's get to it. Before we actually start the assembly of the pieces of profile we're going to be using on the base, I just want to go over real quickly with you on the basic hardware pieces we'll be using. All the connections will be made with these cap bolts and T-nuts. Now, these are 40 mil, obviously, because we're using 40 mil profiles, T-nuts. And these are the twist-in or roll-in type. And they have a spring ball, which is a ball that is actually capturing a spring underneath that keeps pressure on the bottom of the profile that you put it in. It keeps it from slattering around. And we're also going to be using these cap bolts. And these are 8 mil threads. And the top is actually a 6 mil for your metric wrench that you'll use to actually tighten and loosen in these. Now, I'm going to show you how this little spring ball actually works. And it just fitted. First of all, you can see that there's some grooves in this. And there's a raised area in the middle. And that raised area is the exact same size as this channel is. So when we slide this in, these two little grooves on the side, or the wings, if you will, are going to be the gripping part that actually grip the profile, like that. And once you slide it in, it won't come out, which is very cool, because if you use the economy nuts, then they slide in and out pretty easily, and they just, you put it, like here, put it somewhere, and if you tilt it at any angle, it'll go running out on you, and then you've lost your T-nut, and you have to go find it. So this is very cool to have the spring, and Predominantly, we'll be using this 8 mil unit, this T-nut here, and the 8 mil cap screw or cap bolt. Now, there is a couple of different lengths for different situations. Obviously, a thinner one would be used to attach something that had a thinner flange on sitting on top of the profile. And they simply screw in like this, and you're good to go. And, of course, we can put it anywhere we want. Oops. <laughs> as long as we don't go all the way out the end, we're fine. And it'll stay right where we put it. Now the, we also have these, which are the same thing obviously, it's a T-nut spring ball, but it has a six mil thread in it. And that's for attaching like your shifter or something like that. And there's a few of these included in the kit also, along with some six mil threaded screws or bolts. And these are pan heads actually. And that's a four mil metric hex wrench size there. Now, we're also going to be using these cool brackets. Well, before we get the brackets, we're going to be using these. And this is for the tray mount. If you go to SimLab's website, you can see pictures of what this looks like on the trays. And it's a simple matter of pushing this out. You can see how it pushes it like that and releases the gears or teeth inside so we can spin this around the handle and get any position we want to and then let it go and continue to screw it in. You might be familiar with this if you're familiar with photography equipment. Different types of stands have these kind of things on it. Uh, some of the tripods and stuff. And probably the, one of the most important parts is our corner brackets. Now these are very nice heavy duty galvanized gusseted. And what I mean by gusseted, they got that extra metal in there. And that gives it a lot of strength. And that's what we want is a lot of strength. They also have the anti-twist tab feature on them. You can see the tab sticking up, and there's a set on each side. And we use that to keep the profile from rotating on this actual bracket. Now, of course, you can see it's not 100% tight. There is a little bit of wiggle room here. But it's better than having just a flat bracket on here that can spin around at will, even though they work fine too, because typically we're attaching the flat bracket to another piece of profile, obviously, and just that combination, once we tighten the, the bolts down, keeps everything where it needs to be. But the anti-rotations are nice so they don't slide around on you and slip around while you're trying to do something and tighten it or run it down a long length of profile. Now, there will be some instances where this works fine if I have a piece of profile that's going across the top this way and the channel is going the same way this channel is going. 
So that profile, this one's sitting here, and I got another piece that's going to be coming across the top like this. So we can use the anti-rotation tabs on both sides, and everything's fine. However, if I have a situation where I have my profile like this, but then I have another piece of profile that's going to be running against this one perpendicularly, so that means the channel is now running this way. So that means, obviously, that it's not going to work with those tabs on there. So we have to just pop these tabs off, and it's made to do that. And to do that, we just take a regular flathead screwdriver, a rather large one. This one's probably about, I don't know, 13 mil or so. And simply get in here underneath the tab. Let's get sideways there. And then just pry up, and you'll eventually get to a point where the screwdriver is going to catch, and it'll snap that tab right off. And the same one, same thing's doing down here. You just snap it off that way. Then we'll have the tabs gone. So once the tabs are removed, then it will be no problem for us to run the bracket like this and then have another piece of profile coming across because it'll be flat here. And we still retain the anti-rotation properties for one of the pieces of profile. So that's what we're going to be doing in a nutshell. And when one's assembled, this is typically what we're going to look like. We got our T-nuts on. We've got our 8 mil bolts in there. And we're ready to assemble the frame. So, now that we're ready to assemble the frame, what we'll do next is go over to where the frame's laid out on some cardboard and start putting this puppy together. All right, now we've got our profiles set out where we want them to be. And of course, these pieces here are actually a 1400 millimeters long. And you can see it has the nice black anodization on there. We've also got two pieces that are 500 millimeters long and they're gonna form the cross members for our bottom frame. So how I'm going to do this, obviously there's a lot of different ways to do this as far as putting these brackets together. What I thought I would do is first just go ahead and put the T-nuts in these pieces and then I'll be able to slide my brackets in along these pieces here and then just go ahead and screw these brackets in instead of trying to drag them all the way down, which you obviously can do but I'm just trying to keep from scratching this anodization at every opportunity that I get. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and put T-nuts in these 500 millimeter pieces so that they'll accept the bolts once we get them in position where we want them to be. So we'll do that. All right, now we have our T-nuts in. Now we can go ahead and slide our brackets in that have one T-nut in them and a bolt. And I'm gonna slide them out to basically somewhere in here because the seat rails are gonna be attached to the top of these profiles. I'm gonna use one of those seat slider profiles to kind of gauge where I need to be at the end of the assembly here. But for first, the main thing I wanna do is go ahead and get this, the two cross members in. So we'll go ahead and put these brackets in where we think they need to be now. All right, now our brackets are in the general area where we want them to be. And what I'm gonna do is put this one on first because this is gonna be the rear. And I know that I want it flush with the back of these 1400 profiles. And then I can put one of these seat rails on and gauge where I need to be. Actually, I can kind of look at it right now and see that I'm gonna, where I should be as far as getting this on top of these profiles. And, I think these are actually can be put down a little bit further this way. Same with these. And we'll go ahead and do that and see where we end up.
All right, so now we've got the basic box formed. My profile fell over, but that's why we had the cardboard, just in case of accidents like that. And now what I'm gonna do is grab one of these seat profiles, and this is what I'm gonna mount the sliders to, or I'm going to mount directly to these. I'll probably actually do a direct mount because I prefer that actually for my setups. So we'll just put this up here and take a look at where we are. And I don't want this hanging off the back here. So what I'll do is probably move this guy in a little bit because this is about flush and where I want it to be on the back as far as this big profile. So of course we'll just take a little, you can just tap it along here and because we still have everything nice and loose, it should come in pretty, pretty well. There we go. And I'll take the other one and put it on here just to make sure I'm kind of lined up a little bit and not have one sticking out more than the other. Now the thing about these profile brackets here is they are non perfect 90 degree brackets. So what will happen is as I pull these in together, it's going to square all this up. And you have to tighten one side and then the other side, then one side and the other. You've got to kind of work it to get it there. So now that I know where my distance is, that looks really good right there. And a little bit out here. Then I'll go ahead and set these aside and get on with the business of tightening this profile up. Alright, now we've got everything squared up, everything's looking good, our distance for our sliders is right on, perfect, and like I said before, it should be perfectly square because of these brackets being square, as you slowly pull both sides in, one of them rotate, it kind of brings everything in and automatically squares everything up, which is another great thing about these 80-20 profiles. So next what we're going to do is actually attach the seat rails, and we'll do that next. All right, we can get the seat rails in now. I've already got a bracket in position to show you how I'm gonna set this up. I'm gonna have a bracket on the outside of each one of these rails. That'll be four of them. I've already got some of the twist-in nuts put in. So now it's just a matter of getting some more of these nuts put in on the other sides. Because everything's sealed up already, we have to do the twist-in nut which is very cool to use anyway. It really makes assembling 80-20 a lot easier. I'd really recommend if you're gonna be doing a lot of 80-20 just to, to order these nuts instead of the economy nuts because they are the more expensive obviously, but they just make your, your day really simple when all you wanna do is add something to your rig. It's already all sealed up and you've got the caps on it. It's looking pretty and you don't want to have to take everything apart to put another piece of profile on or mount a peripheral. So we get the twisties in and then we'll go ahead and get our brackets attached. Let me get this twisty in here. Sometimes they can be a little fiddly. There we go. Right, so now it's just a matter of getting the brackets bolted up and the brackets, one side is flat. We've taken the tabs off like we saw in the other video in the hardware part of the video. And I've left tabs on one side so that it will lock into this channel nice and tight. And then of course we can't have them on this side because they would not match up with the slot. So we'll go ahead and do that.
All right, so I'm just going to leave them like it is now because really I'm not sure where the seat's going to be sitting until I'm ready for that. But I will just go ahead and make sure they're kind of snugged up so they don't fall over the place when I put the feet on this rig and because the feet will be next. And it's just a matter of we're going to tilt the rig over on its side and slide the adjustable feet on here. We'll do that next. The feet are ready to go on now. And as we saw in the hardware section, these are pretty neat feet because they're going to be adjustable. Easy enough to put on. All I'm going to do is slide the frame over, rock it up on its side, and then just slide these feet in. And I'm going to make sure that I keep the anti-twist tabs in line to where they're supposed to be. And we'll slide one down here. And all you have to do is tighten up on them with that knob and it, it tightens it right away. Do another one. I'll leave this one about right about here, I guess. You can always change it easily enough once we're done. All right, two more and we're done. This is the easy part. back down and now we have to worry about scratching our profile anymore so what I'm gonna do next is I'm just gonna snug up these brackets not these because I'm gonna be needing those to be loose later so just to get the the bottom base tightened up to where it should be and then when we come back we're gonna start working on getting our motor mount uprights installed so we'll get to that next these are the parts we're going to use for the wheel or steering wheel motor mount upright. And actually, this is just one half, but the other half is going to be identical. First off, we're going to be using the spring ball T-nut, as usual. And these are 8 mil threads. And we're going to be using these flathead 8 mil bolts. Now, this has a 5 millimeter hex head in it, so we'll be using this 5 millimeter wrench on it. And they're flatheads because if you look at the plate that's actually going to attach this profile to our frame that we already have, it's got these nice countersunk holes in it that are going to allow our flathead bolts to fit in there below the actual surface line here. So when we, we're actually going to mount this part up against, and you'll see this when I do it, up against the... 4160 profiles that we're using on the bottom part of the frame on this cockpit. So pretty simple. We're just going to put these in first. Now, of course, these holes here, the, the ones that are closest to the center, will be the ones that we're mounting on the profile, like that. And then, of course, these flathead bolts will fit right in there like that, with a T-nut on the other side. And then we're going to go ahead and set up our T-nuts for the other side so we can actually slide this thing on. At least that's the general idea. So we're going to bolt this together and see what it looks like when we come back. All right, so now we're looking at the end result. And you can see that we have the flatheads attached so that they will not interfere with the sides of our cockpit once we slide this on. And that's what I'm going to do. Basically, I'm just going to hang this straight up like this. And once we get these T-nuts started, and make sure we have enough space on those T-nuts so that they will clear the channel well with plenty of room. Because when I slide this on, I'm going I'm to actually put my hand underneath it and give a little support on the bottom as I try to slide this along. So it's essential that these have plenty of space between the T-nut and the surface of this plate so it won't stick on anything and it will actually slide because remember we're going to have some resistance anyway from these spring balls that are in our T-nuts. So next we're just going to go over there and slide this on and see how it works. So now we're going to go ahead and see if we can get this slid in without too much trouble. Sometimes this can be a little bit fiddly when you're trying to do four at once or six at once or it just kind of doesn't fall your way sometimes. 
but we'll see if we can't get this thing in here without too much trouble. I'm going to put the top one in first, get it started. Reach down here to the bottom. And hey, that went in a lot easier than I thought it would. Do the same thing with the bottom. Kind of tilt it over a little bit. Looks like it'll hold that top one in place. And then I can kind of push the bottom one in place also. And there to have it. There it goes. So now I'm actually going to use my hand, my right hand here. I'm actually lifting up a little bit and using my left hand to pull towards me because I don't want to scratch the surface of this anodized aluminum. Now you will get some scratches on inside the channel. Really, that's inevitable, but you really can't see that too badly. So I'm just going to lift up and move this. And you can see it's sliding pretty smooth. And really, I don't know where the final position is going to be on this. So I'm going to just snug it up so it's not flopping all around when I move the rig. And then I'll make the determination later of exactly where I want it to be as far as the reach for my seat angle and where my seat's going to be and, of course, where the pedals are going to be. So what we'll do now is go ahead and assemble the second upright install it, snug everything up, and then we'll go look at what we have to put together for our pedal tray. All right, now we've got all of our parts assembled here, and the main part of the pedal tray is going to be these 40 series profiles. We've got two 580 long profiles, and these are 4040s, singles. And if you look here, they actually have a thread on the end of them. And hopefully you did not use these for your seat rails when you put those on. We got a piece of a threaded hole at each end so we can run bolts into them obviously. Got two of those. I got one of these 4080s which is a double 40 in the same deal. They also are tapped and threaded on each side. Now we're going to be assembling them with these 10 millimeter thick aluminum brackets. Lots of adjustment ranges here as you can see as far as where we're going to put our profiles. Also, they have slots down here that are going to allow us to adjust the rake on our pedals. Very nice. Nice heavy duty units. We're going to be using these cap head bolts that are 6 mil on the cap head for your wrench and 8 mil thread size. And we're going to use six of these guys, the usual T nut spring ball die. Now we're going to be using these handles on the brackets that are connecting everything. And these are the spring loaded jobs. You can see it move there. So it allows us to rotate the handle if we catch something or it's interfering with something as we try to tighten or loosen this. And you'll have one in here on this slot. You'll have one in the slot over here. Or you could actually put one down here. It depends on what you want to do. And we'll have one up here probably. So. This will allow us to loosen these quickly and adjust where the position of the pedals are and also allow us to adjust the rake on the pedals as far as the height and the rake on them. Very nice. Right, so I think that's about it. We'll be using our 6 mil wrench for this because we, these are 6 mil obviously. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assemble this on the actual cockpit frame because it seems to me it's the better way, just trying to assemble it all right here and, and put it all together seems to be, it's not going to be as easy as just laying everything across the frame and going from there. So when we come back, we'll actually be over where the frame is and with these profiles sitting on top and then we'll go ahead and assemble it. So I've got the brackets pre-assembled here with, well, all the T-nuts will stay on. I have them pretty loose because I don't want them to bind up when I slide them in. So I thought this would be the easiest way to do it, just to go ahead and slide everything in pre-assembled, and then we can bolt these profiles to where we need to in here. So let's see how this works. Slide the first one in. Now if these guys will line up easily for me. that and we're in all right so now it's just a matter of taking our eight mil bolts and screwing them into our profiles 
And this is the way on the instructions that these things are bolted up. And of course, the back spacing is going to be really dependent upon what you're doing as far as your, your pedals that you're going to be using. I'm going to just go with this one and see what happens once I get my pedals on. And again, this is very easy to change, obviously, just a couple of bolts on each side. Right, so that was simple enough. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and get the other side in. Once I get these guys just a little snugged up over here. So we'll go over to the other side and put that plate in, screw everything up tight, and then we'll come back and look at the functionality and how this pedal tray is working. All right, everything is tightened up on the top part here. And of course, I've left this loose because we don't know where the pedals are going to be, but you can see it just slides back and forth like this. Now, there is, like we said before, an angle adjustment on this pedal tray. It's not the easiest thing, though, as far as you have to bring, to be able to get this to come up, obviously, this particular, on each, each one of these sides, this bottom lever or bottom bolt is going to keep it from going up or down, which is a good thing if you want to keep it flat. So, the easiest way to get the angle right on this is, first off, you just take this one out on both sides. At least that's the easiest way i found to do it. The reason is because now we can actually lift this where we want it to be and tighten these back down, right? And if that's the rake I wanted, I could use that. Now, all the way at the top, I now have, and I'm going to use this camera angle over here because I can actually take this T-nut out and put it back in here and scooch it in there enough to where I can actually get the thread on it. But you see how close that is with this guy here. And even if I take this and rotate it out of the way a little bit, I'm still hitting over here just a little bit until I get started. So I'm actually not getting started. That's why it's not getting tight. But because of the way this thing works, I'm not lined up either. So it can be a bit fiddly, but then when you're making adjustments to your frame, sometimes you have to spill a little blood. <laughs> okay, I think we're, we got it going in now, but now I would have to keep taking it and redoing it and, until I could get it back in there. I would almost, at this point, think that, well, if I was going to do that and I wanted to keep this T-nut secured, I would just take another one of these bolts and stick it in there and be done with it. Now, another thing is, if we can actually go on a higher rake than we're at, sitting at now, and what we'll have to do to do that is actually take this loose on both sides, the back. I'll go ahead and make sure these guys are loose too. So it slides back and comes out. Then we're going to go this height. So I'll take one of the T-nuts out and put it back in here. Get it to stay for me. And now I can go in and let this guy will be out of the way because he's out now. I can go back in and use this lever to get the extreme rake. But again, that would mean that this lever is not being used anymore. We just have these two. But I can't believe that with these two tight on both sides that this, this is going to go anywhere as far as trying to slide back on you. I just don't see that happening. So you can actually get this degree of rake in it, but you'll just be leaving this out. So when it's sitting flat, sure, three levers, everything works great, no problem. But when it comes to the angle adjustments, you're going to have to make some, some adjustments to what as far as how many bolts you have in holding things down. So I just thought I would show you that because it's not in the instructions anywhere. It's, it's just not something that straightforward. When you see it first, you think, oh, look, we can just roll this up and, and not have any other issues or any other adjustments we have to make. But that's just not true in this case. We have to change things around a little bit. But that's what 8020 is good at. So I have no problem with this, by the way. 
I, I would have no problem having it up this high if I needed that rake and with my pedal set and just having two of these in here tightened down. There's no way that I'm going to be able to push this tray back away from me when I'm pushing hard on the brake pedal. I just don't see that happening. So there it is, the pedal tray. What we'll do next is get to the shifter mount. So we'll do that when we get back. So now we'll look at the pieces that are going to make up the actual shifter mount. And basically it's just four pieces of profile. We've got, let's see, a double. That's a 4080 and that's 580 millimeters. We've got two smaller ones at 250 millimeters each. And then the last one is 350 millimeters. Now, we also have this bracket that's very reminiscent of the bracket we use for the motor mount uprights. And it has the recessed or counterboard, countersunk holes in it. So it's going to hold these 8 millimeter screws. So we're going to have one of these in here like this that's going to go into this piece like that. Then it leaves two open to go into the track of the bottom frame part, the 4160 part. We're going to need three of these, the usual T-nut, spring-loaded. And we're going to need eight brackets to make this work. Now, four of these brackets are going to be with the tabs on one side, like here. Get a better shot of that. Give me some focus. There we go. You can see the tabs there, but on the other side, we don't have any tabs because of the way that the bracket's going to be joining other pieces together. And we're going to have four of these that are going to have the tabs on both sides of the bracket because they'll be joining straight channels, and you can do that. We want to keep the tabs where we can. So, Really not a, a whole lot to look at here as far as the parts concerned. Basically these two pieces here, the 250s, are going to be sitting, once we have it mounted, like this on top of this main bar that's coming back from the motor mount upright. And this bar is going to be on the back of the upright, or rather this bar. And it's going to be sitting, taking the weight of that bar on the back part like that. So we're going to need two brackets on for this because we're going to need one on each side. We're going to need two brackets for the front of this where it mates to the motor mount upright. So that's four. Then we're going to need one, two, three, four for these guys. We're going to need one on each side. So we'll have one down here like this on each side like so. And these will be the ones that we're using that have the flat on them because as you can see when we're mounting it this way we're only going to have opportunity to use the channel on one of these. So it'll be the channel under this is where the tabs are going to go, and the flat part will go against the side. But you'll see that once we get this all configured. And I'll probably leave these two 50 millimeter pieces off until I get these pieces mounted to the upright. So what I'm going to do now is just put together this piece and this piece for the, for the shifter support and come back and we'll take a look at what that looks like once it's configured. All right, we've got our brackets assembled. This is the main piece here, the 4080 lateral part that'll be attached to the upright this way for the motor mount. And then towards the rear, we don't have anything because the back is actually going to be sitting on this support that's vertical. And it'll sit right there just like that. And, of course, you can adjust it if you want back and forth, being 80-20 and all. And we can't forget, obviously, that we're going to have this part in the bottom channel of the 4160 profile that is making up the frame or the bottom part of our cockpit. Now, of course, this could be in a higher position on that profile if we wanted it to be. I'm just going to leave it like this for now. And it'll also allow me to demonstrate some of the limitations of this kind of setup also. And... We've already got these guys set up because it's pretty simple. All this is going to do again is sit right on top of this, just like that. Just slide right up and down to where you need it to be. And like I said before, this is the brackets that have the flat part on it because they need to be flat to slide against this 
they won't match the channel. But we did leave the tabs in over here, so it gives us that anti-twist effect. So all we have to do now is go over and get everything hooked up, and you'll see me just sliding everything together. All right, we've got everything in position. So all we got to do is put this stuff on. I'm going to put this bottom support or the perpendicular support on first, and I'm going to put this in the bottom channel. Of course, you could move this bracket around and put it in any channel you wanted to, obviously. But I'm going to use the bottom one. So I'm just going to go ahead and slide that on first. Get my ridges out of the way. And this should go pretty quick. Try to get it in the general area that I think it needs to be for this top crossbar to land on it. I'm just going to screw these in just a little bit to snug things up so it's not flopping around too bad on me. But you want to keep it loose like that when you're mating it to this piece. And this piece, again, pretty easy to get it on. This slides down the front of the motor mount upright until we come down and get to where we want to be for sliding this part in. So once we have that done, it's just a matter of sliding this back and getting it lined up. You see it kind of fell down on it, which is what we want it to do. And just bring this in. And you're going to want to put your hand on the front here and kind of lift up, take pressure off of it so it doesn't try to bind up on you when you're bringing this in. It's kind of a jiggling act here. Okay, we're ready to go. And then we're in. And of course, I would back this out and make it nice and pretty and flush once I had it where I wanted it to be. So really, that's all there is to it. Now, as far as adjustments go, because of the kind of mounting plates that Simlabs is using here, the adjustments here are kind of, well, it's a little bit, it could be easier if it was just these type of brackets holding all this together. It would just slide around a little easier. Because of the way this bracket works, though, if I want to lower this, because my shifter handle's too high and I need to lower it, or I want to get it really low, I could just take the whole thing off and use this instead, this upper part. But to adjust it, you have to, first of all, let me make sure we got this kind of snugged up here so it doesn't, you see how it kind of lifts up when I'm tightening it. Let's get this one. I oh, man, tighten too much there. Let me back it out just there. There we go. I'm trying to get this bottom bracket. This is where I can get uh, just a few turns on it. All right, so this kind of hanging midair on us now when we're moving the, the bottom part out so I can show you this. Right, so you want to change the height. You have to loosen these up, of course. And then you need to slide the whole thing out. And I do mean the whole thing all the way out. Because the only adjustment we have for height, try not to lose any nuts when you do that, but that happens with 80-20 more than I'd like to admit. <laughs> right, so you only have one bolt here, and if you want to adjust the height of this thing, then you have to go in, take it off, loosen that, and then slide it up and down to the height that you want. I'm going to put it back down the bottom. So it's a few more steps you have to go through to adjust the height on this. And when I put it back on, slide this back in. And get everything lined up. And actually, I think I left that a little high this time. So we have to loosen these up just a little bit, which Normally, you have to have it loose anyway, as we saw before, to get it to jiggle around to where it's going to go on again. So, get this back on, do some more jiggling, and we're in. Right. So, go ahead and straighten this guy up. Another problem here, well, not really a problem, it's just an adjustment consideration that you're going to have to make. If I wanted to lower this whole shifter platform, then this obviously is going to hit the floor in another inch or two. 
So I would need shorter pieces of profile to be able to do that. In fact, I was thinking about just cutting this profile up, moving this all the way up to the top groove here, and that way I could come down further and not hit the ground. I think this just needs to be shorter and it'll probably save me some time as far as being able to go up and down with this. But that's something I'll look at when I actually have the need to do it. So, one more thing. Of course, we have our cross pieces here and they are going to go on the top, just like I showed you before in the other part of the video. And these are a simple matter. Again, these have the flat, the tabs removed off of these sides of the bracket because as you you can see that we got one channel moving this way, we got one channel crossing across the top, and it just wouldn't work if we left both tabs in. So, easy enough to slide one of these in here, and grab the other one, slide it in, and then of course you'll have this one and another one, and you can move these at will. If you were running like a shifter and a handbrake, you might want to just go ahead and get yourself a piece of, which I, I would probably do, quarter inch aluminum plate and just put a plate in between both of them, bolt the plate down to the profiles and then have holes in the plate to mount my shifter and my handbrake so I can get them just exactly where I want them to use them. So, this is a very solid unit. This, this whole rig is very heavy. It's got a lot of mass to it, which is gonna make it very solid. It goes together rather easily. It does take a little time. You have to, you know, you don't wanna rush it uh, you don't want to scratch it up it, any chance you get, even though this anodized profile or any anodized aluminum for that matter is easy to scratch. So we're done with the assembly here. Well, close to done with assembly. We're going to put the motor mount in. But the last thing we'll do is put the motor mount in and see how that looks. And then we're going to go to part two of this review where we actually set up the rig itself. And that means putting a seat in it putting the motor on, putting the pedals on, and putting a shifter on, and see how all that looks. Okay, so now we can actually start assembling our motor bracket. And this is a direct drive motor bracket. And you can probably tell that it's meant to never ever flex. <laughs> it's got some nice cool looking cutouts in it, very sporty looking. And this, because it has these slots in it here, it'll take up to a 54 Colmorgan motor because I use the SIM steering version two motor system. I have a 52 Colmorgan rather, and it'll fit in there with no problem. But you can see that this is a massive piece of metal here. It's just huge, it's 15, actually I think it's a little over 15 mils. Let's see what we got here. Put it on here, let's take a mic it out for you so you can see what it is. All right, so there it is, 15.3. Wow. Yeah, this thing is never going to flex at all as far as a twisting motion because when we're pushing on our steering wheels and we got all that force coming out of the motor, it really puts some torsional force on this mount. But yeah, <laughs> I got no problem thinking, I got no problem with this one because I think it's going to have no problem handling my motor or even a 54. It's just really huge. I mean, look at this. This is a 10 millimeter here, this, the wing bracket. And you can see the difference here. It's just, yeah, big, big difference. So, very nice piece here. I really like this for the direct drive motor mounts. And these wings are going to fit on here. I might as well show you what I have it. Like this. And we're going to bolt these wings to the front piece with these. Let's show you these corner brackets. And we have already taken the counter rotating tabs off because we don't need them in this application. And we'll be using these flathead screws that will go into the countersunk holes in the wings and on the front of that motor bracket so it'll look nice and flush and nice and custom looking there. We'll be using these bolts or rather nuts here and there's the usual nylon rimmed safety or lock bolt if you will so they won't vibrate off. And really I guess that's about it. Uh, now I do have this other mount and I ordered this also because I do a, a lot of reviews on wheels like the Logitech and the Fanatics, Thrustmaster, so forth and so on. And I wanted a, something that I could actually mount all those wheels to, and this is what this is. That's where all those holes are so that you can mount any wheel out there, supposedly. We'll find out. I actually have a, 
uh, Sims, uh, Sim Experience, rather, AccuForce 2, version 2, that I'm going to see if that fits on here, too, that I'll be doing a review on in sometime in the future. Right. And when we actually slide this down into the motor mounts, the uprights for the motor mounts, we'll be using these cap bolts in the usual 8 mil T-nut configuration to slide down to the three channels. We're going to have a bolt in each channel. And, of course, being a 4120 profile, we do have three channels on those uprights. Right. So that's about it. What I'm going to do is go ahead and assemble this piece. And once I have it assembled, we'll come back and look at it with the wings on it and the brackets installed. And then we'll go ahead and install these other nuts and bolts over here so we can go over to the rig and just hopefully <laughs> slide this thing in and then tighten it up and we'll be good to go. Right, so we've got the wings attached to our bracket now and I went ahead and put these bolts in also that are actually going to go into the channels. And let me show you a little close up here. This went in really nice. I like the way that everything goes in flush and matches. Put that down to good machining and low tolerances. And the brackets themselves go together really nice. They're actually almost touching each other. And the safety nuts and all the bolts came together really nice. It really feels like it's going to be a nice, tight, torque-resistant <laughs> connection. Now, all we have to do is get the motor mounted. Now, you could put this on the bracket and then mount the motor. But I thought I might try, instead of having to have the motor and you're, you're kind of got the motor in here and you're trying to put bolts in. Of course, if you had somebody to hold it for you or help you, it'd be different. Fortunately, I don't. So I think I'm going to mount the motor to the bracket first. And then I can carry the whole thing over to the rig and just kind of grab it like this and kind of manipulate it back and forth, even being able to hold the motor with this hand. And then once I get it started, and then I should be able to get these things in pretty easily. At least that's the plan. So, when we come back, we'll have the motor mounted, and then we'll walk over and see if this thing will go in those slots. So, yeah, I'm really happy the way this turned out. It did go in the way I wanted it to, and I have the two bottom bolts went into the outside channels, and the one in the middle went into the middle channel here, which allowed me to rotate the wheel and get it just where I, I need it to be. So, yeah, this really worked out well, putting the motor on first, so I didn't have to get in here and try to wrestle with these safety nuts and the big bolts here and try to hold it and, and tighten it at the same time. It would have been pretty much near impossible, so I just mounted it while it was on the bench. Right. So, that's it. Everything's tightened up. This thing is a, a rock. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. There's not any flex at all in this thing anywhere. This is uh, one heavy-duty motor mount. I'm really happy with this. And I'm not real happy with stuff a lot, but this is going to be great. I could turn my force feedback up on this 52 as far as I dare to go, and I have no fear that this is going to move at all. And, of course, being tight and no, not moving and not having any flex, another reason is we have it is not because just for feel, but because of the tactile feedback we get from the feedback on these motors. If we have flex in this cross member and it's twisting on us while we're steering real hard and going over curbing, then we're losing some of the fidelity of the force feedback that these wonderful Cole Morgan motors are capable of delivering. So yeah, I'm real happy with this solution now. All right. So yep, that'll do it for the motor mount. Final thoughts on the build process for the SimLabs P1 Black Edition Sim Racing Cockpit. If you have ever built a project using 8020 profile, or some like to call it aluminum extrusions, you know what a great material it is for this. What I consider to be the most customizable or adaptable material available for our purposes. The only difficult part is coming up with a design you want and then sourcing all the bits required to complete your project. Buying an 8020 cockpit kit alleviates a lot of the worry of buying too many parts and bits that, well, you just end up not using eliminating any savings you thought you were going to have by sourcing it all yourself. That's why I now buy all of the larger projects I want to do in a kit form. Just uh, a lot less hassle at the end of the day. Now, I still buy my own profiles and fasteners for my smaller custom projects. The profiles and fasteners that SimLab uses in its kits are all top flight bits. 
They are massive 4160 profiles for the cockpit's base, which makes you feel like you're sitting in a boulder. It's so solid. Just no movement or flex anywhere. The motor plate is also a massive 15 millimeters. When you mount your direct drive force feedback motor to this piece, you can be sure that you won't lose even the smallest bit of detail that your motor can deliver. Just a solid cockpit throughout. All the hardware to assemble this cockpit was present and accounted for. So no need to stop mid-build and wait for the manufacturer to send in the missing pieces. So as far as the build process is concerned, I'm very happy with the results. Now it's on to the second part of this review, where we'll be mounting all of my racing hardware, like the wheels, uh, pedals, seat, and, well, anything else I need to start driving this cockpit. So I'll see you there. I'm Barry Rowland, and thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel.